The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, welcome everybody, ladies and gentlemen, to the uh, May issue of Coffee with Kalefi. Um, today we're going to be talking about Legionella, the causes, prevention, some of the components that we offer that can help you uh, make sure that you're keeping yourself and your clients and your customers safe and uh, what the latest technology is and, and where we stand with the different standards and stuff. So um, we're delighted to have Kevin Freak, our product manager, pound for pound, probably one of the best product managers in the industry, I'm proud to say, and he's going to be uh, uh, doing the presentation today. We'll kind of banter back and forth a little bit on some questions and stuff, but um, uh, probably the most important uh, issues to, to reference for the topics will be uh, 22 and 21. We've talked about the Legio mix valve there for uh, mixing and Legionella per, uh, protection and also the uh, thermal setter valves. And Kevin will talk about those a little bit more in detail as, he's, as it rolls through here. And there's our guy. Take it away, Kevin. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. So today's topics are uh, on this slide here. We'll talk about what is bacteria. We're, we're not going to get into all the biology. There's a lot of material out there for that, but we'll briefly talk about it and where it comes from, uh, how it affects us and our industry, you know, as, as designers and plumbers and contractors and engineers. Uh, here's the core of the presentation today. How do we control it in domestic hot water recirculation systems and specifically using thermal disinfection? So I'll touch on some of the other ways to control Legionella, but that's, that's uh, our focus for today. Is it safe? A lot of people ask, well, that sounds great, but you know what? Is it safe? So we will cover that. And compared to other methods, you know, what are the pros and cons of using thermal disinfection? And uh, how is it implemented? How do you actually do it? You know, how do you, how do you get that done? <clears throat> and uh, what are the requirements for my system? If I want to do this, what do I need to know about uh, and able to do, the, to, to do this? So, all right, here we go. Um, so Legionella is a type of bacteria that's found in, in uh, it's everywhere. It's all around us, in warm and hot water. Um, somebody needs to mute there. Um, it's everywhere. It's in lakes, rivers, you know, uh, all around us. It's natural. And uh, it can survive drinking water uh, treatment processes like monochloramine or other systems. They, they can do a good job of getting rid of most of it, but it can slip through uh, the processes for treating the water. And closer to home, we will find it in potable water systems and in storage. Uh, it will get into our piping and it looks like this. So if we have, uh, not if, but we, we do have warm water, air nourishment, you can see there that cross section of the pipe, anywhere there's scale or corrosion or a biofilm like that, uh, and you have stagnant water, those are the ideal conditions for growth. So uh, that's what it looks like inside of a pipe and that stuff, um, if there's a little bit in there, uh, that's one thing, but when it gets really thick, it can be, become a problem, and we'll talk about that a little more. That pipe cutaway is, is, is pretty, uh, pretty telling, isn't it? Uh, let's talk about the temperature and time relationship uh, related to Legionella bacteria. This is a, a nice graph. It's really important because what it tells us is at cold temperatures, let's just start at the bottom there. So below 68 degrees or so, that bacteria can live, but it won't um, it won't multiply. But as you come up the the, the uh, thermometer there, you'll see that in that green range, that's where the bacteria can grow, and it really loves that warm water, 95 to 115. Which, unfortunately for us, that's very common in our domestic hot water systems in that range. So um, coming up the scale some more, once we get above about 122. Uh, they won't. They they will will survive, but not multiply. And then you can see as you go up there, uh, 130, 140, 150. So the hotter the temperature, the faster the bacteria will be killed with hot water. And the thermal disinfection range up there between about 160 and 175, then you're instantly killing uh, bacteria that are exposed to that that kind of water. So what's important to take away from this is the time and temperature. Um, relationship in how to control the bacteria. So how does that affect us? Uh, of course, we just talked about that being in the piping. So as we look in our buildings and our design systems, we have showers and, and bathtubs and uh, the, the bacteria itself is only a problem if you inhale it and get it into your lungs because that's a nice warm breeding ground for that bacteria. 
uh, if you drink it, it goes through your system and our bodies can handle that. Um, our digestive systems can, can manage, manage that. But when you get it in your lungs, then you can get uh, Legionnaire's disease or another name for a mild, more mild form is Pontiac fever. And of course, we all know how dangerous that can be. So that's when it's a problem. So there have been cases of this disease reported as a result of um, someone inhaling water vapor in a spa or a swimming pool and even a fountain in a hotel. So the, the, um, the issue you know, is, is also found in those areas. And then of course, cooling towers, which is a whole nother webinar, okay? That's, that's a, different, a whole different topic, but that's where it all started back in 1976 with that convention in Philadelphia, I think. A lot of us know about that, but we're not going to get into that. That's a chemical treatment process. Here's a graph that's really interesting uh, that shows us the reported cases. Okay, it's just really increasing, and you know we talked about this being around forever, right? Legionella bacteria is not a new thing. So why would there be so many more reported cases lately? One of the main factors is that our designs are using low flow fixtures um, and, and the water conservation efforts that are underway. Of course, that's always a good idea to conserve water, but if you think about that, uh, what does that do for our buildings? Uh, it makes the water in the building older, right? We're, we're bringing in less fresh water and we're saving water so that water sits in the warm piping in the building for longer periods of time. And the low flow fixtures are, um, one cause of that problem. New and improved testing, um, that is something that's relatively recent uh, that um, testing centers are specifically testing for that bacteria. There are some areas uh, where I've heard that there are efforts to decrease the storage temperature for domestic hot water. I, I don't know uh, if that's a good idea though because then we're right back into that prime growth uh, temperature range, but there are some papers that I've seen that suggest to do that to save energy. And, you know, um, the average age of the population is getting a little bit older too. So people that have um, immune systems that are maybe compromised or older people or uh, sick children are specifically, um, you know, inclined to, to have a problem with Legionella uh, as opposed to it. But, healthy adult. So where do we see these systems? Okay, all the buildings that we design, right? We we work with hotels and resorts and schools and universities and all of these things have showers and spas. Uh, and I mentioned the um, importance of, of um, the domestic hot water in healthcare and hospitals. Of course, that's a very, very important area of concern for us. And most cases are coming from healthcare and hospitals, and uh, specifically senior living centers. Here is actually an article that one of our partners out in Salt Lake sent us uh, just two weeks ago. You can see the date on this, April 26th. So this senior living facility actually had to close down because of an, out, an outbreak of the, the bacteria in their domestic hot water system. So it's happening. Uh, you'll see articles like this if you haven't already. So senior living, very, very important. So if you work in or if you design systems for these types of facilities, uh, this topic is, is very important. So what are we doing about this as an industry? Uh, ASHRAE is heavily involved, uh, of course. This uh, 188 standard was recently um, updated, you can see the date there of 2018. And what they did is they changed the code uh, language to be enforceable. Uh, and what that does now is it allows uh, that verbiage to be included in, in local codes. And uh, it will eventually show up in codes. I don't know if it has. If anyone knows about, uh, about any areas where this is showing up, let me know. Put in a comment in the comment box down there because we'd like to know about that. So that's a voluntary standard. This is this is brand new. I just learned about this that ASHRAE is teaming up with NSF for uh, developing a standard called 514. I don't know if anyone's heard about that, but um, it's going to be an actual standard that will be coming out, and I'll um, see if I can get more information about that too. 
There's this uh, great document that I've read uh, called Domestic Hot Water Systems, this uh, ASPE document, and that's a great reference uh, for this topic, and it has suggestions for design criteria, like uh, running research pumps constantly uh, and stuff like that, so it's a great reference. And ASSE is actually coming out with a professional qualification uh, for, for, you know, you can become a specialist in this topic. So that, that's pretty cool. That's encouraging. So there are a lot of things going on in our industry, like uh, the World Health Organization has publications on this. Uh, the VA Directive 1061 is a good reference for this. It's the Center for Disease Control, the CDC has a toolkit that talks about the importance of risk management and the importance of routine sampling too. So there's plenty of literature out there for us. All right, what are we doing today? Um, there are point of use filtration devices. So there are different ways to disinfect what I call a focal disinfection. So these uh, filters that actually attach to the fixture, uh, those are out there. And uh, from what I understand, they're pretty effective. Um, they can be expensive, of course, and you have to uh, replace them once in a while. Uh, I don't know how often, but um, they, they work. Ultraviolet radiation, I classified that as a focal disinfection method because, uh, you know, it doesn't add any chemicals to the water, but it is, is effective at the point of installation. So wherever it's installed, it will kill the bacteria as it passes through that chamber. Uh, and these are used in conjunction with other methods sometimes like thermal disinfection. So uh, you see those out there, they of course have to be powered. Uh, they can be high maintenance, I understand, and they are subject to scaling. So those UV tubes probably require cleaning and, and periodic replacement. Another focal disinfection method is increasing the storage temperature in, in your tank. Now that is just a, a, a focal disinfection point because it's not protecting the rest of the system, you're just protecting your tank. More of a systemic approach, uh, copper silver ionization, there's a lot of material out there on this, but um, I've seen that it's used a lot in hospitals and hotels. And I guess it's pretty effective from what I've read, it can be expensive. But um, what it does is it releases copper and silver ions into the water, and those will kill the bacteria. I'm not an expert, but that's what I understand. Um, chlorine dioxide, there are these systems that actually generate chlorine gas, and you install this on the site, and it's very specialized equipment. And it, um, it, it controls the biofilm, maybe a little better than chlorine and uh, slightly less corrosive to the piping. But again, it's a very expensive system and uh, high maintenance costs associated with any, anything like this. Monochloramine is more of a municipal water supply um, uh, method to control the bacteria. And it's used actually a lot. Uh, I think uh, 20 or 30% of municipal water supplies actually am, uh, are using monochloramine. Chlorination, so there's a couple of ways to add chlorine. You can do what's called a low level continuous chlorination. And what you have to do is maintain the level of chlorine. It's very important to maintain that very, very accurately as a maintenance person. Uh, it does get through the whole system. Um, and you know you have to replace that chlorine and keep an eye on it. So it's pretty high, to, high cost to, to maintain and keep that right. And then there's shock chlorine. Is, Chlorina hyperchlorination, sorry. Um, and that's more of an emergency method uh, to er eradicate, you know, if you have an outbreak and a, a test shows that you have a big problem, you can do a shock chlorination. Of course, that's that's going to be really expensive. Um, it's, not, it's not good for the pipes. Uh, it takes a lot of time. And of course, you have to flush and rinse a couple of times. So that's another way of handling it. Ozonation. Uh, I don't know a lot about this, but it's a system that's used, I think, more in Europe and Asia. Uh, it doesn't add chemicals, but it just actually adds ozone to the water. Uh, the equipment seems to be really complicated and very expensive, but uh, it is one method. Now, here's the method we're going to talk about today, thermal disinfection. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of that, I have a poll question. So we're going to ask Woody to uh, to put this poll question up, and it is, have you 
been or will you be involved in a domestic hot water project that's using thermal disinfection as a means to control Legionella? So I want to know how many of you out there uh, have actually worked on a system like this. So um, Bob, you want to go ahead and keep an eye on, on what, what's going on there? So it looks like we've got a yes at 44%. No at 47 percent and uh, NA at uh, nine percent. So, oh, yeah, that's more than I would have I would have guessed. That's great. Thanks, Bob. Hopefully, we can swing that a little bit today. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think that thermal disinfection is the best way to control Legionella, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of the the rest of the presentation here. So, what is it? Just in a nutshell. You raise the system temperature, the recirculation temperature into that kill zone. Remember the red kill zone I talked about. So you do that for a certain period of time and we're gonna get into some details on how you do this actually. And you have to do it frequently, daily, if you have a, a system that is really um, needs to be monitored carefully or if you have a clean new system, maybe only weekly. Again, regular testing, no matter what you're doing is highly advisable. So how do you do this? To do thermal disinfection, you need an electronic mixing valve. Uh, here are some different brands, uh, different styles, different types of products on the market today. Uh, you know, I guess technically you could do it with a thermostatic mixing valve, but what you would have to do is manually turn the dial up to 150 or so, if you can even go that high, and then it's, it's re requires all manual intervention. And you don't have any uh, information about what you're doing or whether or not you're successful. So really it's not pr practical to attempt this using a thermostatic mixing valve. It's the best choice for an immediate outbreak, right? All you have to do is, is jack up the temperature, right? You don't have to add chemicals, you don't have to do anything else, and you can increase your research temperatures. Uh, pretty much only takes a few minutes to do that, if, as long as you have the the hot water supply system that's capable of producing that temperature. And this is used extensively throughout Europe. This is not new. Um, it's even mandated in some facilities in Italy, like uh, healthcare facilities, clinics, anything like that. They have to do thermal disinfection. And countries like Germany don't even allow chemicals. So that's that's the method they're using. So what we're doing, uh, Coffee North America, is we're bringing this technology to North America and we have a solid history behind it. So uh, we, we have that going for us. Of course, if you do thermal disinfection, you're not using any chemicals. We all know the benefits there, the environment, the humans. Uh, we're not gonna dump anything bad down the sewer and we're not gonna waste any water. And think about the cost too. If you already have an electronic master mixing valve, to do this really doesn't cost anything. Um, it's you, it's it's already built in, so that's another good good reason. Let's look at some design considerations. Let's start at the head end, okay? Um, with the master mixing valve, we need to properly size a master mixing valve. If you have inch and a half pipes, you don't just put in an inch and a half master mixing valve. And this this really is uh, for any any type of valve, uh, let's let's take an example here. Let's say that uh, on the plans or specifications or the engineering documentation uh, is indicating that you need 100 gallons per minute of domestic hot water. We can use this graph that's in our literature and see what that would look like in terms of valve size uh, for the Kalefi Legio mix. So if you come up here, you'll you'll run into this two inch line and see that, okay, if we use a two inch valve uh, and at 100 GPM, we're looking at just a little over four PSI pressure drop. Now, anything below that is gonna be such a low pressure drop that that's, that valve is gonna be too big. So we can come up to the next line and here's an inch and a half valve. Now our pressure drop is about maybe about eight PSI. So as you go down here into the, you know, 50, 40, 30 GPM, we're still gonna have enough of a pressure drop to be able to throttle that flow. So I would say that this inch and a half valve is the right one for 100 GPM. And if you look at this table here that we have in our literature, you'll see too that that's right in this area. Uh, so that would be the right size valve for that application. 
you want to stay within the min and max flow rates. The minimum is just as important as the maximum. Uh, in our literature here, you'll see that our one inch valve has a minimum of 3.1. This one has a 4.4 and 6.6. .6. You have to be able to provide at least that much flow through the valve so that it can throttle and can control properly. Now, usually you're going to have a recirc pump that will be able to deliver that minimum GPM. So just make sure that that's the case and then the valve will be able to provide uh, good, accurate, stable control. And that's true for anyone's valve, by the way any kind of mixing valve has got to have a minimum to be able to throttle and control properly. Maybe the most important, or at least right up there, is anti-scald protection. This is a safe process as long as you provide anti-scald protection. Some of the pre-submitted questions were about the safety. Well, if you have anti-scald protection at every potential point of use, you can do this. You can elevate your research system to temperatures that are are uh, very hot as long as you have protection, like an, uh, a shower valve or a point of use ASSE 1070 valve that can limit that temperature to prevent scalding. Here's a graph that we have in a lot of our uh, different pieces of literature, and it shows temperature versus exposure time. So you can see here, for example, 130 degree water you can touch that with your hands. Um, when, once you start up, start getting into maybe 10 or 12 seconds, though, you know you, you, that's that's going to be burning your skin. And you can see here, as soon as you get up into the uh, 150 or 160 range, you do not want to get any exposure to that. So this is an illustration of the importance of providing anti-scald protection. Another important design consideration, dead legs. Uh, these little green circles here represent areas in the piping that are between the fixture and the recirculation pipe. So anything that is in this type of um, arrangement where there's not a flow through it is considered a dead leg. And we talked about stagnation and biofilm. We need to minimize in our designs the, the dead leg areas of the piping. And this, this thing down here is kind of an illustration of what you can do uh, if, if possible, bring your flow as close as you can to the fixtures. Now that's not always practical, of course, but uh, there are some fittings like this available out there. And uh, if we implement designs like this, and whatever you do, just, just minimize the, the dead leg piping lengths if, if you can run the research pump all the time. We did have a few pre-submitted questions about this too. Um, OSHA and ASHRAE 188, they both condemn the practice of using an aquastat to cycle the research pump. You wanna keep that water moving. Um, there's no reason to turn the research pump off, especially if you're using one of these modern smart pumps because they only draw like 20 or 25 watts when they're running at minimum speed. So they're extremely efficient and you really don't need to uh, turn them off. They should be excluded from your energy conservation measures. Another important design consideration, and I think this is probably mandated in most areas too, is to insulate your research piping. The graph is, is, is really makes it very clear the difference between non-insulated and insulated. Um, so it, of course, um, non-insulated um, is, is going to cool off a lot quicker and then you're going to find your recirc return temperatures falling down into that 110, 100, 100 or even lower temperature range, which is a problem. So what about system requirements? Let's talk a little bit about if we want to do this, what, what kind of devices and system components do we need? I'm just showing a couple of generic um, heat sources here. First of all, of course, we need to be able to generate that kind of water uh, temperature. So whether it's a, a tankless or a storage tank, we have to be able to generate water, for example, 100, 160 degrees. We need to make sure that everything in the system, the piping and everything else can handle that temperature for short periods of time. And this is just a piece of pipe that I have in my office here and I took a picture of it. It's 
good up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit at 100 PSI, and that's only an example. I'm not going to claim to be a piping expert, but whatever you use, you need to make sure that it's rated for that. And this includes the pumps. Uh, they need to be able to handle the temperatures as well. Everything in the system, whether it's a, a, a valve or a, a, a manual, manual device, anything that's in there uh, has to be able to handle that temperature. So uh, I guess the point, point is pretty clear. Let's get into some details here. How do we do this? How, how do we actually initiate this, this um, procedure? Well, first of all, uh, you need to initiate the procedure with either a, a button on the electronic valve or um, in the case of the Kalefi product, the, the Legio Mix has built-in schedules so you can program uh, in the controller to do this automatically uh, every night, for example. We're gonna talk about that. So what we do first is we elevate the temperature uh, to 160, or if it's already stored at 160, we're in good shape. So what our control does, if you look at the schematic right here, this shows an aquastat set for 140, which would be the everyday operating temperature. In parallel with that set of contacts is a second aquastat and a relay. So this relay is in our controller. This is the relay that will initiate the disinfection process. So these two devices are in series in parallel with the T1. So what happens when the controller closes this contact, it will enable this T2 or this uh, high temperature aquastat to control the water temperature. And this, this storage pump down here, this, this is just represents your heat source. So if you have uh, a heat source that's a pump or a burner or whatever it is uh, that's going to bring your storage temperature up to 160. So this is specific to our controller. So that's how we do that. That's shown in our installation and information. Second, you need to make sure the recirc pump is running. So if it isn't already, uh, we have another relay, relay number one in the Legiomix controller will close. And that would typically be wired in parallel with the time clock, or if, if you have a strap-on aquastat that's running your recirculation pump, you would use this relay R1 to go ahead and make sure that recirc pump is running. In the controller, we need to change the mixed temperature set point to 150, for example. And we need to make sure that we're looking at the return temperature and in our controller, we're gonna say that we're setting that for 140. And I'll talk about how important that is. This is all based on return temperature. Here's what we do. So in our literature, we have these recommended disinfection times. So 160 for 10 minutes, 150 for 15 or 140 for 30. This is in relation to the return temperature sensor, not the supply, not the mixed outlet. You need to make sure that you're looking at what's coming back from the system to make sure that everything is exposed to those temperatures. So let's say with this graph that in my controller, I said I wanna start the procedure at uh, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, I want it to run for an hour. I want my return temperature to come up to 140 and my mixed temperature to come up to 150. So at two o'clock, the controller says, start, start the procedure. The supply temperature will increase up to 150. The return will follow. And once it gets to 140, I'm gonna start a timer. And this timer, it's configurable. I'm going to say, let's make sure that we have for 30 minutes, 140 degree water in that return pipe. Now, if this temperature drops down, then the, the controller will stop counting those minutes. And then as soon as it gets back up to 140, it'll pick up and start counting again. So this may not necessarily be a flat line. As, as long as we get a full 30 minutes, of 140 degree water in between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m., then the controller says we've had a successful disinfection. And by the way, these are all adjustable, the 30 minutes, the 140, the 150, these are all parameters that are in the controller. And what you do is you set this to go on Monday and Wednesday and Friday, or you know Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, whatever you want, there's a seven day schedule in the controller and you just enable those days, set these parameters, and it does it automatically. 
And when it's running, here's what you'll see on the screen. The, the, the main screen will show that disinfection is running. And what it's doing is it's measuring and recording that return temperature and the supply temperature, actually, and, and the time. So this data logger inside the controller has 40 days worth of information. It's a first in, first out uh, buffer that records all these temperatures and any alarms uh, for the last 40 days. So this is all in the unit, it's recorded. Uh, and it can be used by the building manager to prove that they've done this this cycle to protect their system. Kevin? Yeah. Hey, before you leave this slide, back on the recommended disinfection times where you, you used the example of 150. That's 150 uh, going out from... No, return. Oh, okay, so one, yeah. 150 return. So that's, yeah, what, that's are... the critical is stay above 150 return is what you're shooting for. Right, right. The Legionella controller, when it does this cycle, zone. So you need to monitor that. Perfect. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. yeah. Any other thoughts, Bob? Any questions on this? This is kind of the uh, the nuts and bolts of the presentation here. Yeah, but there is one comment I will make because I see on the attendees list we have some of the water heater manufacturer people on board today is we need to have some way that we can tell the source of the hot water to kick up to that elevated temperature. I know you showed an aquastat that would say, okay, I want 160, but you know, the boiler, the water heater, the indirect tank, whatever it might be, needs to have some way to, to get to that temperature. So on a boiler, on a water heater, for example, maybe a second set of contexts that uh, when they're, you know, enabled, it would go up to a higher elevated temperature because, you know, somewhere the, the system needs to go up to 160 just because the Legionella uh, valve is telling it to go there. Unless you're storing your water at 180, there is no, you know, source of 150, 160 degree water. So we need, uh, you know, the manufacturer to step up and give us a provision that uh, our co controller could just send that signal out and say, okay, I want you to go to that elevated temperature for this period uh, also. Otherwise, you got to build that in somehow or maintain a higher temperature. Yeah, right. That's a really good point. And that's that's a great question because I don't know how many commercial heaters out there can take a contact input. Now, you know, you can wire the T1 and T2 together in parallel, right? So, but the, the, the challenge might be, do you have a second port to install the second Aquastat, right? Yeah, exactly right. You, need, yeah. you need to have, as, as long as you have a second port where you can install that second Aquastat, the wiring uh, this wiring can land all on on the two terminals, right? Because the T1 and T2 will be in parallel. So. Yeah, and I think a lot of the, it, like indirect tanks, it might just have a sensor instead of a second aquastat, and that sensor just sends a signal to the control that's on board the boiler or the water heater saying, okay, you know, this is when I need you to, to step up. Somehow we need to get the, you know, the water to that temperature. Right, right. And, so. and Kevin, uh, along those same lines, there's a number of questions concerning the uh, recirculation pump. Um, you know, in California, uh, the code requires the, uh, the pump to be, how is it worded here from Mr. Harlan, the California Energy Code requires research pumps to be controlled either with a timer or an aquastat. So if you're, if you're controlling with an aquastat, <clears throat> then what you'll need to do then, I guess, right, you'll have to, in parallel, wire against the, 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 the contacts for the aquastat, right? So you, so you basically override them. Yep. If it's off. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That little symbol up there of the clock, that could be a, a time clock or it could be an aquastat. It's just a set of contacts. Yep. Okay. So if it's off, then it will enable it for the disinfection cycle. Right. Because we're wiring that relay one in parallel with those uh, other contacts. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Good discussion. So um, then we have a, dis a successful disinfection. Uh, the controller will actually say this on the screen, and I guess that's the uh, the old uh, English way of spelling successful, but we'll fix that. Um, so then the controller actually will tell you that you've had a successful disinfection. Remember, if it sees that the required temperature for the required time, then it considers that cycle to be a success. And after that's done, this is an option. There's a relay number four on the Legimix controller, and it's a flush valve relay. So if uh, your your end customer wants to bring that temperature down right away, you can you can flush that hot water. Now, in talking to our colleagues over in Europe, that's really uncommon. Most most places don't do that. They don't want to waste that water because you don't have to. Um, but that's there. You can use that if if you want to. And so that would be 
maybe opening a couple of solenoid valves somewhere and dumping out that hot water. Of course, then you have to be worried about dumping 150 degree water down the pipe. I don't know if that's even allowed in some areas. So those are the four relay contacts uh, that are on uh, on the Allegimix controller. Hey, Kevin, uh, another question before you leave this slide <clears throat> came in, pretty good one. Um, if, if we're controlling the return water temperature and we want it above 140 F, um, what is the supply? Basically, is there some, for an unknown system, is there some experimenting needing to be done in terms of what to set the um, outgoing temperature is uh, coming off the hot water heater or through the mixing belt? Yes, uh, usually the system will be designed for a certain delta T. Uh, 10 is pretty common. Some some designers will make uh, a delta T between supply and return of five. So depending on how it was designed, yeah, then you have to uh, enter the appropriate set point for your mixed temperature set point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. It may, it may be it may be have have to be a little higher, or maybe it can be a little bit lower as long as you get that return. Uh, at least 130, because remember the graph, remember the kill zone, we've got to be up in that area. Okay. So the lower, the lower the temperature, the longer you have to run that cycle too. Okay. And will you be talking about uh, scald protection at the fixtures during the disinfection cycle or need for protection? Um, yes, yeah, we, we, we um, had a slide on that, the importance of anti-scald or the shower, the ASSE 1016 uh, shower, um, scald protection devices, absolutely imperative. You can't you can't not have those if you're going to think about doing this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And this is a really cool video. I wanted to just take a snapshot of this. Uh, it, if, as long as you get a copy of this presentation, you can check that out. Um, it's it's um, it's a well done video by our group over in Italy. Uh, or you can go on YouTube and just look for Kalefi Legio Mix, and you'll find this video that explains how that's done. Let's look at a schematic. I like this schematic for a few different reasons. Um, first of all, uh, it shows all the piping. Uh, oh, and there on the left is a little abbreviated uh, thermometer of our, of our temperature and time relationship. So what I want to look at here is, let's say during normal operation, just everyday operation, we're storing at 140. We come out, we mix down to 130. These are just examples, right? So we have our mixed mixed um, tempered water going out to the system. It's coming back on this orange dotted line. Here's our recirculation pump. So that's wired to the Legio Mix controller. The recirc pump is coming back. Here's our return sensor. So that's the important one we've been talking about. And now uh, what we need to do is T off in the piping, put two check valves here, and most of that water is gonna go back into the cold inlet for the mixing valve. And then some of it is going to come back here to the tank. Now we need to do this, why? Because we can't just send all the water back to the tank because then all that water is gonna come out here and it's not gonna have anywhere to go if this valve is closed to the hot port. So most of it will be coming back into this cold return. Now, we have another webinar that talks about temperature creep, so I won't get into that, but I just wanna mention, because this valve closes off 100% on the hot inlet and cold inlet ports, that you won't get temperature creep. So, because it closes off tight, you don't have to have balancing valves right here to ratio the amount of water that's returning back here to the valve or returning back to the tank. You don't need those balancing valves because this closes off bubble tight. All right, so we've got that coming back. Now, if you don't have a tap in your tank or back to your on-demand de on um, heaters, then all the, all the water has to go back here, okay? Uh, so this is nice because it shows check valves here, here, and here's your expansion tank. It's a nice schematic. This is in the Legio Mix literature. So these are some temperatures that would be good temperatures for normal plant operation. So what does it look like out in the secondary circuits? So we're sending out 130 degree water, uh, and then we have these risers or takeoffs or secondary circuits, whatever you call them. And in each of them, I'm showing an anti-scald valve and a balancing valve. We're gonna get into some balancing here in a few minutes, but 
uh, we show those for each each takeoff to each group of fixtures. And we're coming back at 120. What do we do, or what does this look like when we're doing thermal disinfection? Here are the temperatures we talked about before, 160 supply, 150 going out, 140 coming back. Now, all of these are in this red zone here. That's, that's what's important, okay? So we need to be up in that area. And here's the secondary, of course, we're sending out 150, bringing back 140. Now you can really understand the importance of anti-scald protection here. You do not want 150 degree water getting out here where it can be um, put in, in use. I have a couple of slides that are specific on the valve. Um, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Legion Mix 6000. So first and foremost, it's a master mixing valve for commercial domestic hot. It has all the standards and approvals that we need here in North America. That's not a problem for any uh, domestic hot water application. What's nice about this, one of the nice things, is that the user interface is complete. It has everything you need. It has all your set points, all the memory, all the buffers, all the alarms and relays. You don't need a separate computer to use this valve or to set it up. Uh, it's very simple to order. You order one part number and you get everything you see here. You get this gauge, you get the mixed sensor, the return sensor, the actuator, the controller. It's very simple to order. It's not complicated at all. It's networkable, so you can uh, set it up all by itself, just stand alone and it'll do its job, or you can uh, tie it into a building automation system. Uh, Modbus is on board in the control and we have an optional gateway to translate all those network variables over to BACnet. I mentioned the automatic scheduling. That's a unique feature of this product compared to the other valves on the market. And I mentioned that 40 day data logging buffer. So day 41 knocks off day one and it continues to record all that, uh, all that history. It's available in 11 languages, and that is just a parameter. So in the menu, you can just change it to any one of 11 languages. So if we have any uh, anybody on the webinar who would like to change it to French or you know Spanish or whatever, uh, there's a lot of languages in there. So it's, it is a global product. We sell this all over the world. And it's been around for a long time. I mentioned earlier, we have a great track record uh, what we had to do for North America is have the body made in um, low lead brass, and we had to have Fahrenheit on the display because we we uh, we don't understand degrees C very well. One more slide on the specifics. Right now we have uh, in our catalog one inch to two inch pipe sizes. Um, sneak preview: we will come out with a three quarter and a two and a half and three inch flange models later this year. So we will have a legion mix for any commercial application you can you can come up uh, come up against. The union connections are really nice with a variety of tail pieces for serviceability uh, and flexibility for whatever kind of pipe connections you want. The brass is a really high quality alloy called eco brass, and it's a DZR type of brass, so it resists. Um, hard water problems of de-zincification or pulling the zinc out of that brass, it stands up to that for longevity. And the seals are very, very high quality peroxide cured EPDM seals, so they'll withstand chloramines and the other, the other stuff that's in the water that it has to deal with. Because it's a ball valve, it has very high capacity and low pressure drop. These CV values are really big. Uh, for a given valve size compared to a traditional globe valve, for example. So high flow, low pressure drop. The actuator uh, can get wet. So if it's in an installation where there's some water splashing around, no problem. Uh, just don't want to put it outside. We don't want it to freeze. And it has a feature called an anti-clog cycle. This is really cool. Uh, every night at midnight, you can disable this by the way, it'll do a full rotation clockwise and then a full rotation counterclockwise to sweep off or break loose any deposits or debris that might be sitting there uh, against the ball and the seal. So it keeps itself clean. Uh, in, in an area where there are hard water conditions, that's a really nice feature. All right, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. We have to talk about balancing. 
And you might think, well, how does balancing have anything to do with Legionella? Well, it, it does. Uh, here's a quote that I got out of ASHRAE Standard 188, which says, we're supposed to do this. Um, in talking to a lot of people, it's usually not done, unfortunately, but proper balancing, uh, we, we just can't say how, you know, uh, um, how important it is. Um, because it, relative to Legionella, it can promote stagnation in bacteria. Look at this branch out here that's not balanced in this schematic. This, this first branch is getting most of the water, the second branch gets some, but out here, if we've got a trickle, uh, or if this system is not properly balanced, remember we talked about stagnation and low flow. This line out here can be really subject to uh, having a problem with Legionella if you don't have it properly balanced. Not to mention the wait time and the wasted water, which we all know about, and the unhappy customers. So important. Balancing valves. There are three types. Manual, here are a bunch of different brands of manual balancing valves. They're probably the most common out there, and there are more of these than any other. Automatic are balancing valves that have a cartridge inside that controls a constant GPM, also called dynamic or pressure independent. And the third type is thermal balancing valves. And this is what I want to talk about. It's my favorite, so I'm going to talk about it a little bit. I'm going to show you what the technology is and how it works. This brand right here uh, is has is, is been on the market for a long time. These guys are really successful. And it has uh, this similar kind of element inside here that modulates and opens and closes the valve as this one down below. This is the Calefi 116 series thermal setter. So this is what I call a thermal motor. And as it gets warm or cold, it expands and contracts. And what it does is it actually opens and closes this valve seat down here to modulate the flow in the circuit. So that's that's basically why it's different from all these others. The manual valves are simply a restriction in the piping. They don't do anything, they don't know anything. The automatic valves will, um, uh, the cartridges inside will move up and down to maintain a constant GPM. And this is the only one that actually uh, is based on temperature. So let's talk a little bit more about that. Here's a graph that shows how it works. Let's say, that you had this one set, and by the way, right here, there's an adjustable knob uh, that makes this one different from the other one I showed you in that this one has adjustment, so you can set it to whatever you want. Uh, if, if we set that to 130, for example, then this is the, this is the um, curve that represents the, the valve opening and closing. If the water is at 130 flowing across this thermal motor, then the valve is down here at minimum position of CV of 0.23. Anything above that, it just stays at minimum position, never closes fully, okay? As the water cools off, that valve will begin to open up and bring more water to the system. Why do we need to even do this? Well, the answer is that domestic hot water research systems are dynamic systems. They're not steady state, right? If they were, we wouldn't have to respond to changing conditions and we could just put in a manual balancing valve and a constant speed pump and we'd be fine. But they're not they're not uh, steady state, they change. The temperatures change, your heat source temperature might change. Uh, when someone on one of the riser circuits has a Roman tub and they open the valves on that Roman tub, that's going to affect the flow in adjacent circuits. So these systems are dynamic. Therefore, the value that um, a thermal balancing valve adds is that it responds to those dynamic changes to provide better control. Um, let's see, what, what do I have here? So with this unit, you install it, set your dial and forget it, right? It's gonna do everything it needs to do to modulate that flow and maintain temperature in that, in that section of the piping. And it saves energy when used with the smart research pump, how? How does that work? Well, if our system is up to temperature and all of our balancing valves are happy, they're at set point and they're all sitting there at minimum position, a smart pump can slow down and reduce the energy that it's using to circulate that water. So I mentioned earlier, those pumps are very efficient. Uh, so they're, they, they are a perfect combination with the thermal balancing valve because they'll control the head pressure as these valves open and close. 
and then the valves control temperature. So it's the perfect marriage. And here's what it looks like when you're all done. This is uh, just a very general schematic. I'm not showing a mixing valve or anything, but sending out 140, coming back at 130, that means all these fixtures are going to be balanced to the right temperature. Now, what, what about doing thermal disinfection? If all of those valves are sitting down at minimum and we wanna do an elevated temperature to kill Legionella bacteria, how does that work? Well, this model of the valve has a second thermal cartridge inside. And when it sees water at 155 degrees right here, it has a quick opening flow characteristic, it pops open. So that bypass cartridge will open up to a CV of 1.2 to allow you to get a nice, high flow through your system. So you can do that thermal disinfection in a reasonable amount of time. Okay, and if you even get hotter than that, then it, it, it continues on and does additional balancing. So this is really cool. Uh, so this is a self-contained way of bypassing this cartridge, which is at minimum, to do thermal disinfection. There's a second cartridge, which basically does the same thing, but it's a little zone valve actuator. It's a 24 volt, normally closed zone valve actuator and a zone valve that goes in this second part of the casting here or the forging. And it does the same thing. This one though, you can pop open whenever you want. You can use a contact on the Legion Mix controller to pop open your balancing valves uh, during the disinfection cycle, or you can use these with any building automation system or any electronic master mixing valve if you wanna do a bypass uh, on your balancing valves. It's just a simple two wire on off zone valve. Um, and it's, it's a great device. It's easy to clean and service. You can see here that um, this middle cartridge here, if you buy the base model, it just comes with a cap. Uh, here's the thermal bypass and here's the zone valve bypass. You can take these out. You can remove this part of the cartridge too if it gets scaled up or limed up or dirty and just clean it out and put it all back together. And it's great for retrofit. We've seen a lot of these products go into retrofit projects uh, where balancing is a problem. And this insulation uh, jacket right here is really cool. Uh, remember we talked about keeping our temperatures up for thermal disinfection. That helps, uh, it's a nice custom fitted uh, insulation jacket. I love this picture. This came in recently uh, on a project and here's 10. 116s all in, in a row on returns from a, a large domestic, uh, this is actually a residential, a huge residential project. And here's our research pump. So that's a perfect installation of how the 116s can look really nice. Here's a nice retrofit of a Legion Mix control valve. Um, you can see that uh, this, it's a lot smaller than what was here, there was a big, thermostatic master mixing valve here. And this one was really easy to put in place. Now the installer didn't take the time to remove these balancing valves. Here are the balancing valves that you would need for prevention of temperature creep, um, but he didn't take them out. He just left them there. They don't, they're not needed for the Legio mix valve. So kind of wrapping up here, here's another picture. Uh, this is a really cool project where one of the Legio mixes was set to deliver tempered water to some commercial dishwashers and washing machines, uh, that kind of thing. And this one was for the domestic and you can see the two controllers, two controllers over here. So that's a lot of information. I hope that was useful. Well, thanks everybody. We appreciate your time. I um, hope, hope this uh, was, was useful to you and I'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Yeah. We'll see you next time.